Hi, I'm Jen Rexford, a professor at Princeton University and a member of the P4 technical steering team. I'm delighted to be here with Daniel Alvarez, Director of Software Development at Barefoot Networks, now an Intel company. We want to talk today about how programmable data planes are enabling unprecedented visibility into network conditions. Network telemetry in the data plane is allowing us to analyze traffic, detect attacks, and diagnose performance problems quickly and accurately, and is even allowing us to start closing the loop, to take action, to block attacks, to fix performance problems directly in the data plane. So I'm gonna start the session by talking a little bit about how today we have so little visibility into network conditions and how the emergence of these programmable data planes will allow us to measure, analyze, and act in place right where the packets are collected in the data plane. But first I wanna talk a little bit about how traditional network management is done. Part of the reason network management is so clumsy today is that the control loop of running a network measuring, analyzing, and acting is done by three separate systems, lots of different data sets, and then done in lots of different places. At the individual devices, the switches, the routers, measurement data are collected about load on the links, the performance of the traffic flowing through the device, volumes of traffic flows, failures, and so on. And that data is backhauled off into a central location, a management system for analysis. To combine data from multiple locations and multiple kinds of data, to put together things like a traffic matrix of the offered load, to optimize routing, to do anomaly detection, to detect and, and diagnose cyber attacks, to localize faults. And finally, when that's done, this central system goes back to the devices through some sort of configuration interface, often vendor specific, to reconfigure the control and data plane of those devices, to reconfigure tunnels or link weights or access control lists and so on. These three steps being separate from one another with lots of different interfaces and standards and de facto standards makes it incredibly clumsy. And in particular, it's complicated for several reasons. First is that the telemetry is sort of the key to all this. Knowing what's going on in the network is much harder than knowing what to do about it. And yet today's measurement has very high overhead because it has to be backhauled to a central location for analysis from many, many different devices. And worse yet, those statistics are often quite simplistic counts of link load over long time scales, coarse grain sampling of packets, data that's good for many things, but not really particularly well suited to any one task, and in particular, not tailored to the task at hand. Second, because the, the configuration of the network is done through Baroque configuration interfaces, there's often a very indirect mechanism of control by the central management system to configure existing protocols and mechanisms and to configure them separately on a distributed collection of network devices. And so the result is a system that's extremely hard to reason about. Many different software components and protocols and interfaces and standards, you know, with all sorts of software bugs, configuration errors, and unforeseen interactions between the protocols. So the emergence of programmable data planes is really making it possible to rethink how we do this, to, to close the loop if you will, to have a more integrated approach to how the control loop is, is run. To start with network-wide goals, objectives for what the network operator wants to see happen, constraints on how that might be allowed to happen, and then a compiler can synthesize the device local pr programs now that run directly in the data plane of the network devices. At, at some level, this is motherhood and apple pie of intent-based networking. But the key here, I think, to getting intent-based networking to work is to have that direct control directly in the data plane so that the measurement you collect is tailored to the task at hand and done it's an analysis done directly in the data plane where you can efficiently reduce the data to get just what you need, just where you need it. And as a result, now the data plane with the actionable data available to it can take direct action in the data plane in a timely and accurate way. And finally, by putting a lot of attention on how we specify network-wide goals and compile them into device local programs, there's a long-term hope that we can make the network correct by construction, by having the compiler generate these programs rather than individual network programmers, giving us a chance to be able to reason about the translation from high-level goals to low-level distributed network programs. So what I wanna do in the, in the rest of this talk is go through a few examples of some work we've been doing in my lab on these problems. It's a work in progress, we're certainly by no means done. But I wanna walk you through two examples, one about managing the queues in the network to measure and alleviate microbursts, and the other to manage routing, to do performance-aware routing. But there are lots of other examples, particularly uh, security 
security applications like mitigating denial of service attacks or blocking uh, hosts with old operating systems uh, and more. So think of these as just two anecdotes in a larger journey towards having a more unified way of thinking about verified closed loop control. So starting with the work of microbursts, microbursts are really common in data center enterprise and, and backbone networks. And they're small time scale bursts of traffic that arrive you know, on the time scales of milliseconds or, or tens of milliseconds or even less. In this graph here taken from a carrier network, we see over time that the queues are relatively modest in length, except for periods where they become extremely long for short periods of time. These are caused by microbursts, caused by bursty workloads that hit the network all at once, clogging the packet queues, leading to packet delay, and in some cases, packet loss. So the network administrator has a difficult problem now. They'd like to manage these microbursts because they cause performance problems. But the workloads are inherently bursty, particularly modern applications are increasingly bursty. Switches that are of lower cost often have shallower buffers as part of how they are made lower cost. And even if you use traditional switches that have deeper buffers, they don't necessarily solve the problem because long queues lead to long delay. And yet they want to achieve high link utilization to be able to take advantage of the bandwidth resources deployed in the network. Bursty traffic, shallow buffers, high link utilization. It seems impossible to have all three, pick two, but if you can manage the microbursts, or in particular micromanage the microbursts, there's a chance to do that. How? By penalizing the flows responsible for the microburst. Something that requires fine-grained telemetry to be able to zoom in and ask a question for a given packet, is my flow responsible for this long queue I'm joining? And if so, handle that packet differently. Active queue management has been a really active area of research for, for many, many years. And one of the challenges is it's difficult to know without more fine-grained information what traffic is actually responsible for the bursty, uh, bursty load in the queue. We'd ideally like to mark packets or drop them in proportion to their contribution to a backlogged queue. If a packet arrives and no other packets of that flow are in the queue, we shouldn't punish that packet. We should punish other packets that are responsible. So for example, this green packet that's part of a green flow that's backlogging the queue should be punished to be able to make room for other traffic that is not contributing to the burst. Whereas a red packet arriving that might be part of a flow contributing say 10% or less of the queue should be allowed to be processed normally. So if we wanted to implement a scheme like that, the marking or dropping of the packet is a pretty easy thing to implement. The harder part is the telemetry. How do we figure out when a packet is being handled what contribution its flow is making to the queue, right? So that's the question that we sought to answer. So you have a bunch of packets in a queue. Here they're colored by which flow they're part of. This could be source IP address or microflow of a five tuple. And we'd like to know for each of these colors how many packets or how many bytes are in the queue. And we wanna do this entirely in the data plate. So how might we do this? Well, we've got a couple of challenges to doing this efficiently uh, in the data plane because the programmable switches, although they're very flexible, to operate at line rate have some limitations on how much memory and processing they can do. So if we wanted to keep a data structure like the table that I show on the right here, you'd need to keep per flow state, and there could be a very large number of flows, and you'd need to update this table twice for every packet. Once when the packet arrives, to add to the count, and once when it departs to decrement the count so that it's no longer held responsible for microbursts that take place later after it's long gone. So I'm gonna walk you through how we do both of those things directly in the data plane and how we got this running on a barefoot Tofino switch. So just to, to illustrate the, the challenge here, if we wanna process each packet only once, we need to have some way of deleting the packets that are long gone. And we're gonna do that in batches so that we don't have to do work twice for every packet. And we're going to, in particular, divide time into windows based on when the packet departs and store information about a group of packets that depart during a small window of time. And we call those snapshots. So here there's S1 for snapshot one and S2 for snapshot two. And we're going to use four time units for each snapshot in this example, although in practice it might be larger. So let's suppose packets of flow A and B arrive and they depart. We're going to, as they depart, add them to the queue, add them to the snapshot. Now a microburst starts, and a bunch of packets are going to start arriving very quickly. Now, what's challenging here is the packets that have already departed the system are not responsible for this microburst, so we don't want to wrongly blame them. But we do want to keep track as these packets start to go through the system 
we're going to continue to keep snapshots on the departure times of these packets in batches. And now this last packet of flow B is being analyzed. It's going to be added to the data structure also. And the question we want to ask is, well, gee, this packet has metadata. It knows when it arrived, and it knows what time it is now. And it realizes it's been in the queue for a really long time. And the question is, why was I kept waiting so long? Whose fault is it? So we want to be able to look at all the packets that have departed the system since time five. Not the ones that left earlier, they're not to blame. Fortunately, those are largely captured by two of the snapshots, snapshot two and snapshot three. It's not perfect, there's a little rounding error around the edges because we're discretizing, if you will, groups of packets, no problem. We're gonna still find that the big guys are gonna be big even if we have a little bit of rounding error at the edges. So by combining the information just in snapshot two and three, we can get information like this that tells us that flow A had one packet, flow B had five, and so on. And in particular, for this flow, it can ask, how much of the traffic in this queue was from my own flow? And the answer is actually a lot of it. And in fact, you're to blame for your, for your own queuing delays. And now you can take action on that particular packet uh, based on that knowledge. Okay, so that's the first idea, how we get around having to process packets multiple times by essentially keeping snapshots and retiring them over time when they're no longer relevant to the current packets that are being handled. Now, in practice, snapshots continue indefinitely over time and we can't keep state about the distant past. And in fact, we don't want to, it's not even relevant to what's going on in the network now. So as we keep these snapshots in the data plane, in registers in the, in the piece of switch, we essentially want to reuse the, the, the space that we were using to store information about packets that are long gone. So at any given time, when a packet goes through the data structure, it's reading from a bunch of snapshots that tell a story about the queue during the time this packet was waiting. And we're also writing into the snapshot that this packet itself falls into. But as we do that, we're going to, in the background, start deleting information about the packets that are long gone, resetting that part of the data structure to zero, if you will, so that later, when this time interval is done, we can rotate everything and start using the old snapshot, which is now refreshed, and be able to start writing the new packets into it. So at any given time, a set of data, a set of registers in the switch are being used to keep information about packets that are relevant to the congestion we're experiencing right now. One snapshot is being written based on the current time, and another is being cleaned up to be used in the next time interval, all happening automatically, purely in the data plane, without any controller intervention. Now, each of these snapshots could have to keep per flow state, and that would be inefficient too. So instead, we use a compact data structure to represent the snapshot. A compact data structure is a way of keeping approximate information in bounded space and with bounded processing. And in this case, that estimate we're trying to compute is the number of packets or the number of bytes for a given flow within that snapshot. And the good thing is we don't care to be particularly accurate about the flows that have small counts. We're only interested in penalizing the flows with very large counts. So if we lose a little accuracy on the small counts, so be it. The data structure we use here is called the Countman sketch. And this is a very commonly used data structure in, in P4 applications because it's extremely friendly to being implemented in registers in the data plane. For every packet, you have C columns of registers and you're gonna increment one count in each of those registers based on a hash of the packet's flow ID. And then you're gonna take the min of those counts to estimate the total amount of traffic or the total number of packets for that particular flow. Some packets from different flows will collide in one or more of the columns, but generally the minimum of the columns will be a good estimate of the total count for this particular flow. Maybe a slight overestimate, but usually with very, very, very low error. And so essentially then what Conquest is, is a set of count min sketches that are constantly keeping track of the most relevant windows of packets that have been sitting in the queue so that we can count across them to figure out a particular flow's contribution to the queue when we're handling a packet from that flow. So stepping back, uh, we, we ran this on the Princeton campus network and also an at and background network on, on a Tofino switch uh, in a passive mode. So here we're not yet closing the loop in the wild. Um, and it, so what do we do at Princeton? So at Princeton, uh, the internet two backbone is a research backbone in the US that connects a lot of scientists together. And our neuroscientists were having a problem. They were doing large data transfers across the internet two backbone. And the link 
to the neuroscience building, on average had pretty low load, but there was a lot of packet loss. People were very confused and the legacy router reported statistics on link load and link loss on a very long time scale. So it was very difficult to understand why the loss was happening. So we plug the Tofino in to two ports on that switch. We tap two links. We see the packets coming from internet two to the border router, and we see them going from the router to the neuroscience building. So for packets that don't get lost, we see them twice. We plug them both into the same pipeline on the Tofino and, and run the analysis from Conquest there with the additional information of joining the two copies of each packet together so we know when it entered the queue on the legacy router and when it left the queue on the legacy router. And then we run all the analysis I described over the last few minutes. Long story short, there were microbursts and the, the, the actual reason is pretty funny. Internet2 runs an active performance monitoring tool called Personar to monitor performance. It sends active probes between lots of Personar per nodes to be able to detect and try to diagnose performance problems. Ironically, Personar generates extremely bursty probes, and it was itself responsible for the performance problem. So this is an interesting punchline. The passive performance monitoring tool that we developed figured out that the active performance monitoring tool was actually the thing causing the performance problem. I think an, an, a good reason why doing performance monitoring passively is a, is a good idea. So based on these results, we collaborated with AT&T to deploy a variant of Conquest in AT&T's uh, ISP backbone network. And sure enough, we see microbursts there as well. And we're continuing to work with them to analyze that data to understand the root causes of those microbursts and, and how to best mitigate them. This is just one example of a larger set of applications we're running on the Princeton campus on both internet two traffic and public internet traffic. And in fact, if you go to our P4 campus website, you can see a handful of apps that we've been running on the Tofino switches to give our network administrators unprecedented visibility into a lot of different things, heavy hitter flows, congestion, um, the operating system distribution of machines on campus and off campus, round trip times of the traffic and so on. It's become a sort of a playpen for both uh, undergraduate and graduate students to try out research ideas and for our network administrators to get better visibility. So I mentioned that that experiment, uh, as appealing as it is, doesn't close the loop. Everything that we did in the campus network and with AT&T was purely passive. Running the Tofino is sort of a glorified uh, packet monitor with the luxury of doing the analytics directly in the switch. It's a nice way actually to get started with deploying uh, P4 switches because it, it doesn't require forklift upgrades to any of the equipment and yet lets you start experimenting with what might be possible when you have these devices actually in line in the network. But we wanted to understand what would happen if we closed the loop. So in the lab, we took a, one of our Tofino switches we have in the lab and ran, uh, ran Conquest there. And in particular, we ran it with an, with an experiment designed to generate microbursts. And we wanted to see what would happen if we did a smarter control loop. So the baseline is to do traditional early congestion notification to mark all packets when the queue is long, causing even the flows that are not responsible for the backlog to back off in response. And then we compared it with Conquest where we marked only the flows who were making a significant contribution to queuing, only those that were causing other packets to wait. And then we ran synthetic traffic and we evaluated you know, what kind of flow completion time we might see for the applications we were running. So the y-axis here is showing how quickly the, uh, the flows finish, indicating when jobs might complete. The x-axis is how big the burst is. And the blue curve shows what we achieve with Conquest, which is lower flow completion times, especially as the bursts get bigger, compared to a basic early, early congestion notification scheme that's unnecessarily punishing flows that are not actually responsible for the congestion. And this is at least gives us some early hope that if we were able to do this in the wild, that we would see performance gains where network administrators could push their networks to high link utilization without having to worry about the performance impact of microbursts because they could manage them directly in the data plane right as they form. It's far too late to do it later at a controller because the microburst is over before you can even fix it. This is just another view of the same data. So this is the the actual queue size over time, uh, when we're running our scheme in blue, uh, time on the x-axis and queue size on the y-axis, whereas the regular early congestion notification scheme, the, the queues are building up and falling down, building up and falling down. So essentially what we see here is that by micromanaging the microbursts, we can keep the queue short all the time 
which is good for performance and also enables the use of cheaper shallow buffer switches that don't have such deep buffers. So notice here we get better performance and we don't need deep buffers because we're doing a better job managing the microbursts. So I'll stop here on this part of the, uh, this particular example. The, the second example, uh, I wanna look at performance aware routing. So, so far we've talked primarily about managing a single queue, but we'd like in this part of the work to talk about managing the routing for the entire network and to do it in a performance aware way. So we really have three goals. We'd like to be able to, to achieve high level traffic engineering goals, such as directing traffic over the least utilized paths through the network. We'd like to impose some constraints on which paths get used. For example, some traffic might be needing to go through a particular middle box that's located at, connected to a particular switch in the network. And we'd like to adapt quickly to changes in performance at data plane timescales rather than in control plane timescales, let alone centralized control plane timescales. So how do we do that? Well, essentially we allow the network administrator to specify their constraints and objectives for traffic engineering, tell us their topology, and then the contract compiler will synthesize the P4 programs that implement a distributed load sensitive routing protocol completely in the data plane. So notice here, there is a central component, but it's just the compiler that creates the P4 programs. Once the system is running at runtime, it's completely distributed and completely in the data plane, but acting on behalf of high level policies that were articulated earlier. So this in some sense does really, does really close the loop. So how do we do that? Well, the high level language that the network administrator uses tells us a ranking of network paths that they that would like to use. They can match paths based on regular expressions and also compute and compare path metrics. And I'll just give you two simple examples of high level policies. Suppose you want all traffic to go through middle box W. Then you'd want all packets to have zero or more hops followed by the hop W followed by zero or more hops. Among such paths, you might want to pick those with the lowest link utilization or lowest path utilization. And that's what's achieved here. If the path doesn't go through the middle box, then it has sort of infinite cost. It's completely undesirable because it violates the constraint that you have to go through the middle box. In the second example, we just want to take the least loaded path. But taking the least loaded path, if it's very long, can be useful if the network is generally not too congested. But when the network is really heavily loaded, it's better to take only the shortest paths rather than take longer paths that have lighter load, because that may in turn congest paths that others may need later. So in this policy, if a path's utilization is below 80%, then we're just going to, to care about how utilized the path is and prefer the least utilized path. But if the path utilization is 80% or higher, we're gonna let path length be the first criteria for picking a path, and then among the shortest paths, pick the least loaded one. So this allows us to balance the tension between taking longer lightly loaded paths when it's reasonable to do so, and biasing towards shortest paths when the network as a whole is more congested. And there's a bunch of other examples in this simple little language that the network administrator could write down. Then we would turn the crank in our compiler to generate the, the algorithm that would run in the data plane. So at a high level, what Contra does is to synthesize a distance vector routing protocol that will run based on load sensitive metrics and enforce these policy constraints. So distance vector routing, as a reminder, essentially from the destination, uh, uh, route advertisements, or we call them here path probes, would propagate information in the reverse path towards the sending nodes. And as each hop goes along, the information about the downstream path is accumulated. For example, this path probe of 0.3 would indicate that the max link utilization on the rest of the path downstream is 30%. It'll arrive at this switch, and this switch could pick this path if it's the best one, and send its data packets in the reverse direction, and then propagate it upstream to the next switch, which will say 20% is less than 30%, so this path still has a worst case utilization of 30% and propagate it in turn upstream. And so this can be implemented uh, effectively on a programmable data plane. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of, of how the Contra compiler works. There's a lot of complex aspects to the different building blocks, but I'll just briefly summarize what they do. So we monitor path performance, as I showed on the previous slide, using probes in the reverse direction to collect and accumulate statistics. We enforce the constraints on paths. Some paths can't be used at all or should have infinite cost or higher cost. As we propagate the probes, we're computing those costs 
And if a path can't be used at all, constraining the propagation of the probes so that those paths never get considered. Once a switch has more than one path to choose from, it's keeping track at any given time of the current best path. When a new probe arrives, that may be overwritten if that new probe indicates there's a better path, or if the existing path has new information to indicate something about its metrics changing. And this is implemented in registers in the data plane that for every uh, egress switch is keeping track of the current next hop en route to the destination. Now, load-sensitive routing notoriously causes out-of-order packets because packets of a flow may, some may go on one path and then another set of packets will go on a different path. A common scheme for supporting in-order packet delivery is flowlet switching, where a group of packets that arrive close in time from the same flow are pinned to go to the same next hop, even if a different next hop now starts to look better. So we do that here in another set of registers to keep track of the microflows and what time scale they're changing. And there's some additional tricks to do this in a policy aware way to make sure that none of the packets in a flowlet get mistakenly routed on a, on a path that doesn't obey the high level policy. And finally, distance vector routing protocols are notorious for having forwarding loops. And we avoid that here in a similar way to a bunch of ad hoc network routing protocols, which is to keep version numbers on probes to make sure that we don't wrongly use old probe information uh, to route when new probe information is available. And that allows us to prevent a lot of forwarding loops that could normally arise uh, in distance vector routing. So each of these are, are little blocks of P4 code that use registers and ALUs and so on to do the computations and table updates and lookups that we need to, to implement Contra, all, all possible in the data plane. So the Contra compiler generates those data structures based on the high level routing policy given by the network administrator. And so we have a compiler written in F-sharp that will take the, as input a routing policy written in our little language and will synthesize the distributed set of P4 code based on the policy and the network topology. And we've done a bunch of experiments with Contra running on lots of different kinds of topologies, seeing what effect it has on flow completion time and comparing to existing static load balancing schemes, as well as hand-built uh, load balancing schemes like Hula, which is, is also a P4 load balancing scheme that, that a group of us developed with, with Barefoot, that essentially Contra could be seen as a generalization of. And we've done this on a, on a simulator that can run P4 code in NS3, and also in, a, in the Cloud Lab test bed. And essentially the high level punchline of the experiments is that the schemes outperform shortest path routing and static load balancing and are competitive with handcrafted schemes like Hula that are written, written by hand. So stepping back, what I've done is shown you two examples of how you might do closed loop control in the network, managing microbursts and doing performance over routing. These are just two of a, what I think are a much larger set of examples. And in particular, there are a lot of examples for, from security that we'd like to explore further. We'd like to evaluate them under more realistic conditions, hardware switches, operational networks, realistic workloads. And the hope is as we go through more of these exercises that we'll identify unifying language constructs that would allow us to speak more generally, not to have a separate language for routing and queuing and, and so on. A, a truly integrative way of thinking of network telemetry and control actions taken on the results of that telemetry in an integrated fashion with a compiler that can generate P4 programs that are correct by construction. So far, that's not the, we haven't closed that loop fully. The compiler we've written, for example, for Contra is handwritten and not verified, but that would be an interesting direction to pursue further to know that the compiler itself is correct so that we can reason properly that the P4 programs it synthesize, synthesizes are correct too. So we believe if we can achieve these goals, then we'll finally be able to realize that high level vision of intent-based networking with an integrated measurement analysis and control made possible by the programmability of the data plane. And I think I'll stop here. If you're interested in learning more about these projects, there are pointers to them on my website. And if you're interested in learning more about our campus deployment of, of P4 switches, please see our P4 campus website. And if you have any interest in running P4 switches in your own enterprise or campus network, please reach out to us. We're really happy to help other people get started in doing live deployments in their own uh, campuses and enterprises. Thank you. Now I'll hand over now to, to Daniel so that he can, uh, can tell us more.
Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Jen, for the earlier introduction. Uh, as Jen mentioned, I'm uh, Daniel Alvarez, and I'm the Director of Engineering for Advanced Applications in the Barefoot Division of, uh, of Intel. Uh, and I want to kind of take a little bit of a step back and, and put into perspective a lot of the research and work that Jen described in her previous presentation. I think it's clear from where we are in the industry that we want to, from a technology perspective, try to turn the technology into the next platform. Uh, it, it, it's what enables innovation to, to continue to, to occur in, in a particular segment of the, of the stack. And, and it's an area where, from a technology perspective, is, is, the, is the nirvana where we want to arrive from, from driving our technology, both from an adoption perspective and a, and a usability perspective. But technology alone is not sufficient to arrive at a, at a platform status. I mean, we can all probably think of dozens of technology ideas that we thought were the greatest technology in the world, but it didn't quite make it to the point of, uh, of becoming a platform where others could build on and, and develop and continue expanding its capabilities. And that's because the technology is not, alone is not sufficient. Certainly, you know, the economy of the technology is important, and more importantly, I believe, is the ability for that technology to be accessible to a large community. Uh, I think what we find ourselves in today is that the technology, from the point of view of network programmability and chip programmability, and, and has reached the point of being both performant and economical at a hardware level, and with the ability of uh, of before to enable programmability into that data plane is opening up the accessibility of that domain to a broad audience that is part of you know before org and this organization in general so i think that the time is becoming critical for us to uh, to exploit this this new opportunity that we have uh, this is all a function of time, you know, the, the, it, it could be a long-term opportunity that we have, or, or it might be a short-term opportunity based on, on how some, some of these variables uh, continue to evolve over time. But the requirement that we have to suddenly convert the data plane uh, as a next platform is to take advantage of, of the time today and maximize each of these, each of these variables uh, going forward. And we got to be cautious that any dramatic shift in any of these variables could completely topple the platform. So it's important to keep in mind that we need to maintain our, our, our data plane to be performant. We need to maintain our programmability to be flexible and accessible. And we need to maintain everything to be economical, both from an operational perspective and as well as from a capital expenditure perspective. And to put things into perspective, we, we only need to think about layer three and layer four in the OSI stack, right? I think it's clear to many of us in the industry that those two layers, everything between layer three and layer five is kind of been stagnant in terms of evolution and development from an industry perspective. Uh, clearly, IPTCP is a, is a clear example of that in that it's, it's been, we, we've been lucky that TCP has been a very versatile and adaptable transport, but it's eventually, it's, it's, it's become a platform or a, or a standard that is, has seen very little innovation in terms of, of innovating at the transport or on the network layer. And that's because, in my opinion, that le those layers have not been accessible to a broad set of the community. And I think that is exactly what we're doing uh, here right now. In, in, in before, what we're doing with a programmable data plane is that we're opening up this layer of, of the stack that has been proprietary and locked down. And now we're opening it up to the community and we see how the academics have embraced that opportunity and start developing research and, and restarted the engagement of, of innovation within, within the layer three and layer four aspects of the, of the OSI stack. In addition to the availability of, the, of a configurable data plane, there's also a lot of pressure from the users, right? The, 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 workloads, the workloads have shifted dramatically from what they were 15 and 20 years ago. And now we're getting a lot of pressure in terms of the capabilities of the network 
that is pushing the limits of, of things like TCP and the existing set of reliable transports that we have available in the network today. And again, if you look at the recent uh, innovation and the recent research, a lot of it has been centered around uh, advanced congestion control and new transports to fit the requirements of the new distributed workloads that the network is, uh, is needs to support uh, currently. So what, why am I so optimistic? I mean, I think it's, it's, there's a pent of demand in this space to really innovate again. I mean, even though IP and TCP and UDP have been very uh, versatile and useful uh, mechanisms and, and protocols to support the higher levels, you know, it, it's, it's reaching it, a whole generation in terms of a time scale of, 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 of slow innovation. And, and the ability to now opening up the, the data plane and really provide a full end-to-end -end capability for us to, to reprogram and, and add functionality into the data plane is really enabling a new set of innovations and new uh, mapping between the applications that need to run in the network and the capabilities that we're developing in the network, both at the network and the transport layer. And we can see today, even after just a few years of, of before and, and data plane programmability, how the innovation is sort of exploding in terms of the capabilities and the focus around both telemetry, network services, how those network services are, are, are converted into discussions about, a, about, about advanced congestion control and how those ideas are driving discussions about new transports and new optimized fabrics for, for, new, for new applications. So I think the variables are now sort of being opening up and maximizing. Accessibility is here through our P4 organization and through P4 as a programming language of the, of the data plane itself. The hardware is arriving at the right level of both performance and economy, with smartness and programmable switches becoming available. And let's not forget that there's still a full-on programmable software data plane that exists today and is being uh, evolved quickly through things like Kubernetes and other uh, overlay networks. And the performance and the economy is there as well in terms of the capabilities of the, of the hardware, right? The hardware now, is, is as economic to build a programmable hardware as it is to build a fixed function uh, chip. So the, the barriers of entry for us to innovate in this space are really being lifted. And it's just now to me, it's a function of growing the community so we can really drive innovation broadly across, across the industry. You know, there was a strong, co you know, I, I go back to, to 20, 25 years ago when I first started in this industry, all innovation was happening in these layers, right? When, when, when all the software, all the switching was software-based, all the exciting innovation was happening at the layer three and the layer four level, and that kind of got sort of withered down with the, with the need of having hardware capabilities and hardware performance, but that, 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 that limitation is not being lifted so that it reopens this area of, of innovation as well for the networking community but we need to rebuild that community uh, as well. And the other part that is clear to me is that any of these threats, you know, we're still on the sort of the first iteration of ideas of what we can do with the programmability within the data plane, and any one of these threats can be revolutionary to the industry. And I'm, I'm gonna talk about a couple of them and, and, and demonstrate how I believe that some of the things could, could move us in a completely different direction. So we're falling behind uh, from a networking perspective. I mean, the rest of the the rest of the of the of the industry has moved into into data as the mechanism to understanding their systems and managing their system and programming their systems. And we're not there yet. Uh, but I believe that now we're in a position where we can turn networking uh, as a data problem and leverage all the tools and all the advances in that in that area to make networking a better a better service. And that's all enabled by telemetry. I mean, I don't, I, I don't blame us for being late. We just never had the data available to be able to leverage some of these capabilities in the networking space. And telemetry just opened up the floodgates of saying, uh, of, of, of providing us with, with reams of data that we can now begin to analyze and understand 
and, and, and learn how to leverage this information to build better networking systems. Uh, so again, you know, from the perspective of telemetry, we're really just scraping the, the, the surface of what is capable. And, and clearly the first step is visibility. I mean, 90% it, it, of, the, of the operators that we, that we talk to really have very little visibility of what is happening in their networks, what, how their networks are behaving, or, or even what applications are running in their network. So starting from a visibility perspective, is, is key because you need to understand your problems before you can start trying to um, try to solve them. And, and as part of this telemetry, as Jen was mentioning earlier, we now have the ability to look at timescales that were never available to us before, right? Microverse is not something that you can debug after the fact. If you don't catch the microverse real time, you will never see the microverse, you will never understand the causes of those microbursts. And now with telemetry, we have this ability to real time be able to understand and analyze the, uh, both not, not only the, the level of microburst activity in your network, but also all the components that are contributing to that, to that microburst. In some cases, it's misbehaving applications, as, as Jen described in her, with, with, her, with her monitoring system. In other cases, it's just oversubscription or, or, or some other event that is causing a uh, uh, microburst event in your network. But the visibility allows us to understand and learn what's driving those, those events. And there's more, you know, now that the data is available, there's, there's stuff we don't know. We, you know, today everything, are one of the biggest challenges that we have in terms of operating the network is that everything is HTTP and port 80, right? Everything, our, our classification capabilities in terms of understanding what the flows in our network are, are somewhat limited because everything is being built on top of a single stack. Uh, so understanding classification, not so much in terms of a five topple, but understanding classification in terms of the behavior of your flows, I think is gonna be one important aspect that we can learn as part of having the ability to analyze the data and understand the behavior of our networks today. And once we have this information, now we have these capabilities to fit the loop, right? Uh, telemetry itself uh, leads to more analytics, which leads to more programmability, which leads to more telemetry. So it is, it's sort of a, a vicious circle, which is, a, I think is a nice positive feedback loop that is going to continue to allow us to evolve in terms of the telemetry capability that, are, that, that we need to implement in the network. I mean, today, if you look at things like, uh, like IMT and IOAM, it's all still very network centric being able to expand that telemetry from network and, and extend it to the edge devices and to the applications is gonna open yet another set of capabilities in terms of the network, not just being a transport, but being part of the scheduling fabric of your computational frameworks. So there's a lot of interesting opportunities available as part of this initial capability, i.e. telemetry that was opened up through the availability of, of data plane programmability. And lastly, I wanted to sort of reinforce the, 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 the work of, of Jen around, around better intent-based networking. I mean, it is, it, there's a lot of work about intent, but today intent, in my view, is all, it's just partial intent. You can do intent around, around static policies in terms of securities and firewalls and, and behavior. It's, it's sort of policy-based intent. Uh, and it's been great, I don't want to put it down, it's, it's driving networking into some of the best practices of DevOps. Tre treating networking not as just a static transport environment, but a continuously evolving environment that requires some of the same tooling that we need to develop software, right? We need to do continuous integration, we need to do quality validation of our, of our, of our networking state before, before we download it. So it is driving some very good best practices in the, in the networking administration space, but it's still limited by its static uh, view in terms of policy and provisioning. And the goal is to eventually have adaptive intent, right? Our intent is not static. You know, the, the network state is not static. Uh, and, and that is gonna be a combination of things. It's not gonna be one single component. There's gonna be some data plane feedback, some tight loops as, as part of either new transports or advanced congestion controls 
or even uh, uh, new routing protocols that are performance-based. And some of it can also be control plane feedback, uh, where some of this information requires a little bit more analysis than, than something as a network device can perform to do uh, better provisioning and analysis of the network. And it needs to be filled with performance information, right? The network is not a static entity. If you look at loads on the network, it's, it's a constantly very, uh, variable, uh, changing variable, and we need to maintain real-time information in terms of the load and performance of the network so that the right intent can be delivered as part of the, as part of the infrastructure. And ultimately, there's security needs to be part of the intent. I mean, does the network have the capacity to detect its own uh, that is being under attack or to uh, detect malicious behavior within the network? These are all things that I believe are now within our reach within the, within the data plane programmability. And it's going to be another input into the intent provisioning system. And lastly, you know, telemetry and analytics are, are key as well to be part of this solution right without i think without data we're we're really stuck in the ground we're not able to move forward i think that is really going to be the opening thread for us to to start driving future innovation within within the networking and particularly the data space and i'm really excited to see not only the telemetry at the networking device level but expanding that telemetry end to end and exposing us to, uh, uh, to the full view of what is uh, happening in the network. And with that, I will, I will stop and try to uh, engage in a conversation with Jen. Wonderful, thanks so much, Daniel, it was a great talk. Uh, I had a question about, about your talk. I mean, I think it's, it's clear that the sort of initial killer app for data plane programmability has been network telemetry, and its early application has been primarily in switches and primarily in sort of data center or cloud uh, settings. And I'm just curious if you think about sort of the next wave of either what kind of device or what kind of network or what kind of applications, do you have a sense of what, what next? What's the next, uh, the next thing that's exciting or what's the next pain point that is really crying out for, for help in this yes, way? Clearly, clearly, I mean, certainly, clearly at Barefoot, we kind of were single-minded in terms of enabling telemetry at the, at the switch and the data center space. And, and, and even in that world, I think you will find that, you know, we, we still suffer from the, from the deployment of the technology that we require to enable this, this data plane and telemetry capabilities. And something that we're doing now uh, as part of a bigger organization is that we now have the ability to have access to the full data plane, not only the switching data plane, but also the servers uh, and the NICs and the, and the Linux data plane as well. And one of the things that we're, we've been doing uh, to promote and, and to keep driving the availability of data for, for processing in the network is that we've enabled INT at the, at the edge devices. And it gives us the opportunity to attack the problem both from the inside out and from the edges in. So we've developed some INT solutions that don't require a full transport network to be INT enabled for us to start gaining some visibility uh, about what is happening at least from edge to edge in your network. So that, that, that is what I see as, as something that we can start driving in existing deployments. I think we will continue to push some specific clusters that require this capability for their performance. So there's gonna still be a push to, to drive telemetry from the network out. Mm -hmm. But we're also trying to come up with an environment where you know, we can monitor the, all the edges of the network and we have very good capabilities to do uh, things like flow latency tracking, you know, from edge to edge. We can actually do any flow drop detections edge to edge. So, so we're trying to now attack the problem both from the edges in as well as from the uh, core of the network out to start growing the, the availability of the, of the data domain. Great, great. So one, one trend we see in the, in the research literature is a number of people exploring uh, supporting parts of distributed services directly in the network elements. This could be key value stores or uh, consistency protocols like Paxos, yeah. uh, you know, or, or other, other, for, other things you would normally consider to be part of a distributed service for things that would run in a cloud. Uh, but viewing the network as essentially a co-processor for, for some of those applications. And, and, and I see people arguing both sides of this, that this is a natural thing to do because it provides natural scaling and speed for, 
for these applications and others thinking that it's fundamentally a bad idea because the network failure modes are complicated and you know breaking the layer boundary is 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 fraught and i'm just curious if you have thoughts there i mean i i, I myself i'm still somewhat torn about i find it fun those papers fun but i'm curious if uh, if you think they're heading in, in a, an important direction or not I I, I've been spending the last six years trying to build computation into the network because I'm part of the, and, and there's, and, and, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I see as, as some of the, the, the problems, and there are some, some solutions to those problems. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, the workloads today have shifted from being compute centric to being data exchange centric. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at things like any, anything that requires data analytics and anything that requires machine learning. The bottom next today is not necessarily the computation, but it's the, the, the gravity of the data that needs to be moved around. Everything requires a global exchange of data. And the network is in a unique position to have that global view of the data, right? Uh, so, so clearly from, uh, it goes back to my, to, to my triangle graph, right? From a technology perspective, it seems to be an obvious direction to go. From an economy perspective and from a performance perspective, there are some issues in terms of, it's not even from a performance or, 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 or technology perspective, but there's an organizational barrier for this, right? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, if you go into any big data center or even to any enterprise, computer network are, are, are clearly divided organizations. There's some clear organizational barriers that we need to start breaking down between, between computer and networking, which I think is gonna be na a natural progression as part of our programmable data plane. I think that the programmable data plane will break some of those boundaries. But even with those boundaries in place, there are ways to eliminate some of the friction of, of adding, network adding more computational capability into the network. Today, one of the biggest barriers is that adding computation into the, into the network breaks all of the existing scale-up models that the big data centers have, right? So, so right. how do we address those barriers in terms of, of, of those capabilities? And there are ways that we've been exploring of not necessarily embedding the capabilities directly into, the, into your core and transport fabric, but putting it within the spine of your network where Acceleration can happen within the network, within a scale-out model that fits the existing scale-out architectures that, mm -hmm. that providers and, and data centers have, but still can leverage some of the compute capabilities that are now available at the global level of the data. So, so I think there's some exciting opportunities that we're looking in terms of sort of load balancing and parameter servers for machine learning that, that can leverage some of these capabilities of still being in the network but not necessarily embedded in the in the core network fabric it might take a little bit more i would say non-technical but more organizational and cultural shift to really do full integration of some of these technologies in the core fabric of the network interesting so one thing i've been really interested in is you know how to get people to deploy these programmable data planes and in the in the p4 campus effort that i mentioned at the end uh, end of my talk at Princeton, we've done this by deploying this, which is sort of on the side. And, and the fact that telemetry is such an important part of the puzzle is actually quite helpful here because you can do the telemetry without necessarily being fully in line. Uh, so it's sort of a nice way to uh, try before you buy, if you will, to get, to get used to programmable data planes and what they can do before you actually forklift upgrade anything. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that as a model and, and, and what, what to do to go, to go further there to to, to lower the barriers to deployment? What, 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 what do you see it? Particularly, I mean, I think even in data center networks, it's tricky to, to deploy uh, new equipment, a new model in an incremental way. And certainly in, in other settings that are, uh, have a lot more installed base, it's even more difficult. So I'm just curious your, your thoughts there. I think particularly for telemetry, we need to expand our reach. I mean, I think today, the world that we live in, in terms of data, data, uh, data plane programmability, and some of the innovation that we're developing, our audience has mostly been around the network architects and the and the and the switch, you know, OEMs, and it's still very low level in the networking skill. And we mm -hmm. really haven't driven this message to the operators yet. And it, it goes back to to 
to, to the aspect of accessibility. How, how do we expand our, our, our circle of influence to just, you know, from, from just being our peers to the operator guys that actually need to solve these problems? And, and that's the part that I think the conversation is now shifting. I think mm -hmm. we've convinced the architects that a programmable data plane is useful. We need to, you know, we do need to get our step in the door to validate the technology that we have. I think that's been validated. So the next level now is to take the message to the operators that are living and breathing this problem on a daily basis. And, and I think that's what's gonna drive the demand. I mean, I think in some cases, there might be some technological barriers where we do need to play around the edges, but I think the programmability and INT or IOAM, just telemetry in general, is arriving to that mainstream level where it's going to be available in every device. I don't think you'll be able to put on a device, a network device out there that doesn't provide the limited mm -hmm. capability because I think we're demonstrating uh, that just at the visibility level, the, 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 the capabilities that you now have with some of these telemetry uh, mechanisms, it, it, it changes the conversation to the operators from being, hey, your network is not working for the operators being able to go to the application guys and say your application is misbehaving. So we're, we're, tr um, we're trying to change that conversation from the network always being the problem to the network being able to have enough visibility to be able to tell everybody else whether their applications are behaving correctly or not. Fantastic, fantastic. So one other direction uh, you know, a number of people have been exploring recently is, is trying to embed more machine learning directly in the data plane. Not necessarily to do the learning there, although that may be possible too, but to do classification there based on learning that's been done perhaps uh, in software uh, or offline. And, yeah. and, and, and particularly to do anomaly detection of one sort or another. And, and as you can imagine, there, there are challenges there. I mean, the data plane wasn't really designed with those applications in mind. So some things are feasible, but it's, it's hard to, yeah. to do, to, particularly the more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, very difficult to, to run them. I'm curious your thoughts there. I mean, is this, is this a case where uh, it's it's just going to be fundamentally difficult, or do you think next generation hardware can make this easier? Or, or, or yeah, I'm just curious. What what do you think about this this general direction of trying to embed more learning in the network? I mean, I think at some point, and it's not just for networking, for the industry in general, we're we're going to find some more heterogeneous computing happening in the networking mm -hmm. environment as well. Right? I mean, at, at the end of the day, you need to build a fast switching chip. It's not going to be a, a general computing chip, although guys like yourself and other researchers are making magic on top of a, of a piece of architecture, but, but it's still not a general computing environment, right? So I believe there's gonna be opportunities to do more heterogeneous computing in terms of combining the capabilities of, of, a, of a data plane with either some sort of custom FPGA programming that sits uh, that sits alongside the, 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 the switching uh, chip, or there might be some other sort of general computers, either, you know, x86 or ARM core types of processing that can mm -hmm. do additional specific computation to aid the capabilities of the, of the, of the programmable ASICs for, for networking. So I think that's, that's going to happen today. We're looking at it more, at, you know, as, as you highlight today, we're relying heavily on, on a loose control feedback loop, right? We can, we can offload that computation out to, to a big distributed compute environment to do that analysis and then try to fit it back into the into the into the data plane. But but some of those capabilities that we see the value of having them being closely tied into the data plane, I would envision that we start developing systems that that start providing a more uh, heterogeneous computing environment to do to do multiple uh, functions. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, if you go back to the points I was making at the end of the talk of having a compiler that can sort of automatically generate the programs that run in the network devices, to the extent there's been work in that space, it's been very focused on homogeneous uh, environments. And in particular, in, in the work that I described, you know, we're assuming that the, uh, a P4 switch and even a, a specific P4 switch, because even uh, programming different devices, uh, uh, even if you're using P4, is still somewhat challenging. Uh, and that seems like that's an area that's ripe for for innovation, if we want to be able to just to start with high level. I do want to speak to yeah. Excuse me. I was going to say, I mean, I, I, absolutely, and I think one of the parts that we really need to keep in mind, both from the industry and from the research side, is is providing the right abstractions. We're kind of opening this new box 
and we really haven't come up with the right set of abstractions for it to be truly accessible uh, to, to a more general pro public than, than the guys that are deeply in the weeds in terms of both before programming and, and some of these you know, capabilities. And that's gonna be a compiler level, right? It's gonna be either a, comp a compiler level or it's gonna be at a set of library levels that can be mapped into, into some of these, these uh, hardware abstractions that we can build on top of uh, some physical chips. Uh, but, but a lot of thought, I think, is, is required in terms of, all right, how do we up-level all of these capabilities so that it's much more uh, accessible to, to sort of a general programmer to go and do something fun and interesting in, in the data plane? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm really glad that P4 is an open language, but I, I don't env envision the network administrator writing P4 programs. Uh, yeah. you know, not that they wouldn't be capable of it, but it's actually quite tricky. Uh, and I think the deeper we go into trying to run things at line rate, you know, as, as I sort of illustrated in my talk, we had to think, you know, we had to really kind of turn data structures on their side and, and, and think about approximations in many places to, to get things to fit. And I think telemetry, it's fine. It's quite robust to to uh, to approximation, the things that are important, you know, uh, stand out even with a little bit of of noise. But it's it's not the kind of thing you could reasonably expect a network administrator who has to master a whole bunch of other things on top of that uh, to be able to generate themselves. And we're we're living that problem today, right? I mean, today we're expanding uh, our data plane across the full end to end. Uh, application and, and we see it that you know there's devices that are running before there's the devices that are that are running on a linux data plane mm -hmm. with its own family of acceleration capabilities and programming capabilities into the data plane right you can do kernel changes you can do kernel modules you can do xdp you can do the pdk i mean the, the, we, we, right now we have a very broad set of programmability constructs for the network and those need to start consolidated into either a set of higher level, level abstracts that can then map into the right data plane uh, programming paradigm that you have in your, in your environment. Yeah, totally agree. And I should just say, I think having P, the P4 language and also the, the barefoot switches available for, is, I mean, it's obviously a boon to innovation in many ways, but I think as an academic, I found it a real boon to, to, to teaching in that I have a lot of undergrad and grad students who do projects with me, in some cases, just a semester project in the case of undergraduate students. And it's extremely motivating to them that they can they can actually build something, right? They take their networking class and, they, and all they hear all day long is that, hey, we, that things work this way and it's not the right way, but we can't change it. You know, and it's, it's, it can be fairly uh, depressing in some ways to, to be doing networking research if your goal is to actually affect change. And mm -hmm. I think it's an exciting time now where that's really changing and for students, you know, that get up to speed on P4 programming, that they can create something, you know, an app of their own. I know it's what got me excited about computer science as a high school student, was I could create my own things and actually run them. And, uh, and it's exciting that networking is, is finally allowing us to do that too. I have to admit, it's super exciting to, to have that group of people coming into the industry, right? Because they don't have the, 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 they don't have the history of it's all TCP and it's all IP, right? Uh, right. We can, we, we can break them all going forward. And, and you know, today we're fighting that, right? It's, it's, a, it's been very successful. It's been a great platform, uh, but it's also preventing innovation in that, in that space, right? It's yeah, along those lines. A barrier yeah. into the networking space. And if we have folks coming in from academia, from schools, understanding that it's really fungible, right? We can change it now, right? There's the, the tools and the capabilities are there to try to come up with something new, I mean, yep. it's, it's, it's going to happen, right? It's, it's naturally going to happen. Yeah, exactly. I was going to add, I mean, for myself, in, in the work I do, I collaborate a lot with people in the programming languages research community and also theoreticians who work on algorithms and data structures for sort of obvious reasons, right? The PL people are thinking about how to specify intent and they know a lot about compilation and the algorithms people know how to define these data structures that are uh, approximate and compact. And, and if I had to explain all the three and four letter acronyms of networking to even begin a conversation with them, that conversation would never happen, <laughs> right? So the, it, the, the sort of um, the simpler, more general abstractions have been a, a huge boon to interdisciplinary uh, work in this space also. Even if these people never go into the networking industry, they're able to inform the work we do and, and we need their help actually quite desperately. And it's great to be able to have a, a meaningful conversation with them without scaring them. 
So how, how do you see your, your roadmap in terms of research evolving as, as some of these abilities and capabilities become real? Yeah, I mean, I sort of organized my, the work I've been doing in two main ways. One is sort of bottom up, taking specific applications like microbursts or performance aware routing and just going deep and viewing the, the switches and the, the programmable switches and the enabler. You know, what, what's the visibility we can get? What's the control we can get? And, 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 and dive in. And to do that with a whole bunch of different applications. And then the other is more top down is to say, hey, what are the high level query languages or policy specification languages that we can compile into, uh, that we can express all these applications in and compile using reusable data structures into the switch. And the two inform the other. The individual apps allow us to identify building blocks that often prove to be useful in other applications and also help us know what the query language needs to let us say. Uh, so these individual projects are both informative for the, the more top-down approach. And they also allow an individual student to really own a particular project and, and know the domain of related work in that area uh, to be able to dig deep. So, so that's been my approach to sort of bottom up and top down and informing each other. And I think as I hinted at at the end of the talk, I think we're now starting to get ready to close the loop where we're not just doing measurement, but also, you know, potentially driving the control actions uh, in an integrated way from the, from the measurements. And so I'm very excited to pursue that further and particularly to pursue it in a wider variety of networking settings. I mean, the data center, obviously, the enterprise, the backbone in the work with Princeton campus and AT&T. And I hope you know, other kinds of access network technologies like 5G will afford opportunities to explore those problems as well. Because there's, there's use cases everywhere and the, the more diverse uh, use cases we look at, hopefully the more sound the foundations will be that we build. I still feel like one of the main challenges that we have right now it would be to really grow this community community and I'm sort of curious in terms of what what do you see from the from the academic side from from students coming in and and how are there how, how have you seen the ebb and flow of sort of interest in networking technologies well I think at a high level networking like a lot of areas of computer science are struggling to attract the, the top students because machine learning is just taking so much of the oxygen in the room so I think that that's sort of not specific to programmable networking if anything if programmable networking is helping because it's showing that there's something new and exciting and, and transformative and quite relevant to supporting you know the data workloads as you mentioned you know earlier in our conversation right those are the if you think about the killer apps up the stack that's that's what this is all about right is supporting supporting those applications. So in a way, it is, it is uh, an enabler for getting uh, students to, to, to feel like networking is an area where they can make a difference, not just intellectually, but in the, in the practice of the field. Uh, so I think that, that's cool. I mean, I, I think um, one, thing, one, one challenge in building the community is there's a pretty steep learning curve here. I mean, it's a, it's a bleeding edge technology and learning before, learning how to program a particular target device, uh, learning how to deploy it on a campus. These are you know, these are worthwhile things to do, but they're not easy. Yeah. And so I've certainly found it helpful as one or two students in my group get up to speed that the others have someone they can go to as a resident expert. And I think that the more we can do to build that community, not just locally within the individual research groups, but writ large, uh, all the better because that will allow more people to get up to speed more quickly and not get discouraged by having to, to learn a, a new technology. And I think that, you know, the P4 tutorials that have been taking place, events like this one that we're a part of, all go a long way both in motivating students to, to participate in this community and also hopefully help, help them get up to speed both on the technology and on what kind of research problems they might be able to attack with it. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, it's been a real pleasure talking with you and I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed your talk and look forward to seeing the other talks uh, at the P4 Summit. Thank you very much, Jen. You bet.